My name is Mario Batali, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Joe, John, and Coleman, and we're talking about La Cucina Italiana. And as we are wont to do, and as we always do, we want to talk about a specific region. Today we're talking about Abruzzo, and more specifically, the town of L'Aquila, which, geographically speaking, is right over here around this part of Italy right here. There's this giant rock or this mountain called Gran Sasso d'Italia, and in its kind of foothills are two very important, important towns, Teramo about here and L'Aquila about here. And L'Aquila is probably most famous in all of Italy for its saffron, which we're going to get to in a couple of minutes here. But it's also famous for its kind of rich, not seafood style, and mountain kind of rustic and rich and simple cuisine. The first dish we're going to make in the show, affectionately called Aquila, is something called taco con ricotta verde, which is the heels of a shoe in a very kind of beautiful, imaginative way, in the same way that a tortellini looks like the navel of Venus de Milo. And then we're going to make some hard spaghetti. So this is a very interesting way we're going to introduce both soft, fresh pasta in a different kind of a recipe and the hard pasta from which Abruzzo has got a lot of acclaim. The last dish is a beautiful Christmas pasta, uh, Christmas fritter, so stay with us on all three. The first thing we're going to do, however, is discuss a little bit the difference between hard and hard and soft pasta. When you talk about that in Italy, hard pasta is generally that which comes packaged, is sold to you already dry, and is generally made of 100% durum wheat and flour and, and water. Soft pasta changes from town to town, from region to region, and may have eggs, it may have milk, it may have no eggs, it may have egg whites, it may have semolina flour, it may have all-purpose flour, it may have what's called the doppio zero or the double zero flour. It varies from region to region, and that's really the beauty of the entire culture of Italy is that for everything right, there's somebody who disagrees with you, and for everything that you do right or wrong, there's someone who may agree with you. And that's kind of the beauty of the evolutionary state of the way Italian cooking works. Mario, yes. when you're cooking pasta, how do you decide when you're going to use fresh pasta versus dry pasta? Well, in Italy, it would be something, the, the distinction between fresh and dried and the way that you sauce it, in Italy, it would be almost something so completely intuitive that no one would ever have to think about it. But the general rule is, if it's vegetables and oils, or even shellfish and oils, the oils don't necessarily do anything to a fresh pasta except be absorbed by it and make it a greasy, slick thing. But if there's something like butter or cheese or something fatty or a really rich ragu of meat, then they'll traditionally serve that with a fresher pasta or a soft pasta made with eggs. Now, this one is a very interesting recipe, and my grandma is actually from Abruzzo, and this is one of the pastas she used to make, and we're taking about a cup and a half of flour, and this is all-purpose flour, and we're not going to use the egg yolk, we're going to use the egg white. Now, the reason that this probably developed is because they were either making zabaione or something else and decided that they needed the yolks for something else, or they were using a water-based pasta recipe, of which there are a lot, particularly in Puglia, where they'll just take warm water and mix that with the semolina flour to create those beautiful orecchiette and cavatelli. In that way, they'll, this is probably more out of figuring, hey, we've got these extra whites, let's throw it in our water-based pasta recipe and see what happens. And in fact, it creates a very interesting texture that you're going to see here that's just a little bit chewier and a little less rich than the regular traditional pasta of Emilia Romagna. Now, the first thing I want to do before I get going on this so that we have it done is I'm going to take one clove of garlic, slice it paper thin, and I'm going to cut up, I mean, I'm going to cook up some beautiful spinach leaves until they're relatively dry. The way I do that is I put them in a pretty hot pan with that garlic, and then I take spinach leaves and I just tear them up. I've always leave just a little bit of water when I wash my spinach so that when it cooks, it also sautés and steams at the exact same time. And you want to do that so that it'll cook a little bit more quickly. If you put this dry into the pan, you'd probably have to add a little bit of water to get it going. Then what you want to do is turn that garlic up onto the top of that so that it cooks all the way through. And the idea being is we want to cook this down pretty aggressively and allow it to be relatively dry because it's going to actually become part of the sauce, which is going to make our ricotta. It's going to turn it green, which is what ricotta verde is. Now, I'm not adding any salt, and you'll very rarely find any salt in any pasta recipes because, in fact, when you season the water to cook your pasta, that's when you're actually seasoning your pasta. And that's why they're very aggressive, and very, it's very important to actually include 
that salt in there because if you don't, it ends up tasting like nothing. It tastes like no dish at all. Now I'm going to add just a little bit more flour. This looks like it's just a little bit wet. So I need to go back and find my bench flour, which is right where I left it. And I'm going to add about a handful. One of the things about any kind of pasta recipe, it's always more important to have a little bit too much wetness in your dough than a little bit too much dryness. So whenever you're working in a recipe from a book, make sure that you always add about a half cup less of the dry ingredient because you can always add it in once it's mixed up. Mario. Yes. Once I was learning how to cook pasta and an old Italian lady told me that the water for boiling pasta should be as salty as the sea. That's exactly how they say it. And that's exactly what they consider in Italy. That's, that's pretty, pretty salty. aggressively salty. And in fact, if you think about it, because this has never seen any salt, that's exactly what it's going to do. It's going to season it very nicely. Now I've got my spinach going over here and I'm just going to kind of stir it around and just keep it cooking. Marla, now, was back, it back to salting the pasta water. There's a point at which, and people disagree, do you salt the water when it's cold? Do you salt it once it comes to a boil? Do you salt it when you put the pasta in? What's the... Our rule of thumb in our family, and the way that the people that I've worked in Italy is, mm -hmm. you always salt it right before you put in the pasta because yeah. then there's never any question. Okay. You know that it's the step that you do okay. and then the step that you do. It's never, you know, I mean, you can taste it and it's very quick. But that's for quantity to... control or quality control rather than because it does something to the water. Yeah, I, I don't think it really affects okay. it. They okay. say that adding salt increases the boil temperature right. lightly, but right. I'm not sure that I've okay. ever noticed any okay. difference. Anyway, what we do is we knead this, then we allow it to rest and put it on like that, just put it under a bowl or in a piece of plastic and then what you want to do is roll it out and the trick to that is making sure that it's dry enough to go through your pasta rolling machine. This is an excellent piece of equipment, this pasta rolling machine and what it does is just takes all the hand crank out of it. A lot of people get a little upset or a little worried about the hand cranking. It's effectively exactly the same technique because these are two metal rollers. The distinction that you might have to discuss with somebody would be in Emilia Romagna where they feel so strongly about the wooden rolling pin on the wooden board adding enough texture to the actual noodle that they can actually taste it when they're eating it. So what we'll do is we'll roll it through like so and the whole trick to rolling through in a pasta machine is that at this point you're actually really kneading it. You're developing kind of that glutinous, beautiful texture that's going to make it taste and feel so good. So you want to do it a bunch of times up at the top before you continue to lower the number. And each time with this dough, because it's a little sticky because of the white, you want to get it in there and go. Now we're not going to go too much thinner than the second number. And what that's going to do is create a very interesting mouthfeel as well as a very nice chew to the dish. So we're going to cut them like that. And those are the tecconi in the imaginary world of Italy. We're going to take our spinach that's sautéed here, we're going to turn off the heat, and we're going to take ricotta and throw it right in there. Now this is a very rustic kind of simple kind of shepherd pasta. I'm going to add about an extra four tablespoons of oil. When we come back, I'll show you how quickly this pasta can cook. And then we're going to dress it up with this kind of melted amalgamation of the ricotta, the pecorino and a little bit of the spinach. So please, stay with us. Hey, welcome back. Now we're just dropping these noodles in here. They're going to cook relatively quickly. We've got them uh, in varied thicknesses. And then what we've got here is our sauce. We're going to put it over high heat for its very last second and just bring them together like so. Now in the meantime, we're going to talk a little bit about starting the next one, which is called spaghetti all'aquilana, which is in the style of the person, hopefully the mother or the grandma or the aunt, from Aquila. And the way that we start it is with just a little bit of onion and some saffron. I'm going to caramelize the onion in a pan over medium low heat and then I'm going to add saffron which we've soaked right here the famous saffron from Aquila that I've soaked in just a little bit of white wine and what that's going to do is create just a little bit of acidity in this very simple and yet totally delicious and traditional sauce. Joe, what kind of wines are we going to think about here? Well, we're going to have a little uh, cherizuolo, otherwise known as rosé. We always talk about the wines that go with the food and I think today we're going to talk about the wines that go with the action of making food. We were up early this morning making fresh pasta and we had our cappuccinos and the first thing that came to mind that we had to roll out all this pasta, what should we drink? And uh, white or red? 
Now, are we all alcoholics at this point, Absolutely Joe? Absolutely not. This yeah. is the appropriate consumption at the appropriate time. Exactly. A, a Cherizuolo is a rosé by another name and just simply made by the multiple Chano grape with less skin contact, which is what gives red wines their color. Mm -hmm. Should be great breakfast wine or good for a light meal and should really be terrific with the uh, ricotta pasta. Beautiful. Mario, I can't help noticing that it looks to me like what you're doing there is making ravioli, but you're too lazy to put the parts together. Well, now that's the classic northern Italian thought process, Mr. Okay. Andriotti. But in the south, of course, they wouldn't see this as lazy. They would see this as being economical. Let's keep in mind, it's hot outside. Do you really want to get together and make that? In mm. fact, that's a very interesting point. That, that in Emilia Romagna, you would take ricotta yeah. with spinach, with spinach right. parmigiano, nutmeg, mm -hmm. and that would be the whole dish. You would make your tortelloni, and you would stuff and serve it with just a little bit of butter, with mm -hmm. perhaps a little bit of sage. Right. And in fact, this is—it's exactly that. It's a lazy thing. But tell me right now, are you going to turn down a plate of these puppies uh, right here? Twist my arm. There you go. And this is exactly as simple as this is could possibly be as a dish. This is a classic dish from L'Aquila. And just works. Actually, I'm going to have you serve them up, Coleman. Go right ahead. There we go. There. Let's Take go have some, one uh, yeah. some tongs. And there you go. Bon appetit, guys. That's about as simple and as perfect as it goes. And exactly a perfect match for this wine because there's a lot of rich fattiness to this kind of cheese and pasta mixed yeah, together. Yeah. And it's yet very austere and it's going to work very well with the fruitiness Thank and you. the lightness. Is that. Yeah, absolutely. Said, and, and, have I uh, done good? You know, next time you want to really have a wine that can go transcend anything, think about Cherizuolo. It really is the, the rose of Italy and a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more full body, but terrific with all types of food. Beautiful. I agree completely. And one of the things that, uh, that we always talk about at the restaurant is that in Italy, although they may have a perfect taste and a perfect combination from everything from the morning to night, a little glass of wine, a specific glass of something, a, a moscato, a little beer, whatever, they're not drinking to get drunk. It's just that everything works really well in their mouth, and it's really kind of an understanding of how perfect that palate combination can really elevate something. Daria? Yes. What's the creaminess from? That's from that ricotta just melting away. Mm. That beautiful. It's not from this. Cheese. Well, this will add a little bit to it as well. As mm. these both melt, you get that almost fondue effect, mm -hmm. which is what's, what's really kind of. Mm -hmm. And together, you get that kind of acidic, fresh mm. ricotta flavor. And then this slightly aged cheese. This is probably a three month old pecorino mm. or a cacho that kind of brings a little mm. bit more to it, a little bit more depth. Now, what I have here are squash blossoms, which are integral to our, cause, to our discussion of spaghetti a l'aquilana. What we're going to do is we're going to take them. If you can get them with the little squashes on, that's really kind of a cool thing. But if you couldn't and you can just get the squashes themselves, the blossoms themselves, then by all means do. And the first thing they want to do is they fry. And of course, because we're in olive oil area below what we call the butter belt, which starts at about the middle to the low end of Emilia Romagna, we're going to have be frying, we're always going to fry in extra virgin olive oil. Now the trick is here, we're not frying them until we're, they're crisp. We're actually kind of frying them to give them a little bit more of that kind of extra virgin olive flavor. And that's really kind of going to be really the basis of this sauce. Now one of the things that's really important to understand is in this region we're talking both fresh and dried pasta. Perhaps the most important and most famous region for all dried pasta is Abruzzo. In fact, outside of Chieti, the town where my grandma comes from, is a town called Fara San Martino, which is in fact the home to two of the greatest dried pasta producers in all of Italy, Del Verde and Di Cecco. And in fact, when I was growing up, my grandparents were involved in shipping Di Cecco pasta. Had we continued and had an exclusive on Di Cecco pasta, I might be doing this show from a larger palace, as it were. Now, we're going to take out our squash blossoms. And you can see they've gotten a little crisp. And we're just going to drain them like so and toss them in here with our onions. We're going to lose that crispness, but what we've picked up is that nearly caramelized flavor from the actual cooking in such a deep fry. Mario, I'm going to add some salt, yes? When you deep fry, what kind of oil are you using? Always 100% extra virgin olive oil. And there's, this is hotly contested by just about everybody in town. But the Italians, particularly the Romans, and this is just a little bit east of Rome, when you taste the carciofo alla Judea, which is this deep fried artichoke in Rome, you'll understand that it, it's not burning this oil. This oil is cooking it at a perfect, they don't fry it 475 or 425 or 395. They fry it about 360, which is a little more gentle. It's not going to give you crispy french fries, but it's going to give you a depth of flavor that will blow you away. Now, I've got my onions starting to caramelize. I'm going to take my saffron, which is about a teaspoon mixed in with four teaspoons of wine. I'm going to add that in there. I'm going to add another pinch of unsoaked saffron and about a half a cup of brodo. Now, in Italy, brodo isn't necessarily meat stock or chicken stock. It's just kind of the bones they have around. What we're going to do is we're going to simmer that for about 10 minutes 
and drop our spaghetti. And this is one of the cases where your spaghetti will actually be the timing of your dish. Drop it in the seasoned water. We're using the exact same water that we already did. When we come back, we'll bring these two together and we'll talk a little bit about Cauchinetti, a beautiful chocolate dessert for Christmas. Welcome back. Well, we've got our spaghetti coming out of the water, perfectly cooked as usual. This is a simple, simple, very austere dish that, in fact, might even present a bit of a challenge to the wine geek at the table. Which one of you guys is going to take, Joe? <laughs> Absolutely not, because we're going to defer to, the, once again, the great multiple Chano grape from Abruzzo. And, and sometimes, instead of decanting a wine like you may have seen in the Chateau fancy restaurant in your town, what we're doing is basically splashing it. And you take a young wine that needs a little oxidation, any household pitcher, and just really pour it out aggressively. We give it a vigorous decant, as we say in the restaurant. We love that, because it's immediate breathing. It gives it a whole new game. It does. And you can see the action that the oxygen's having on the wine. And I'll pass it down to Coleman. And uh, we're going to start with a little multiple channel di Abruzzo. Do you need this back? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Joe, if you'd serve up while you, you guys are it. tasting that, I think it's going to be a very interesting combination. The saffron in this dish with the zucchini, we're finishing with a little bit of that scamorza, and I finished a drizzle of hot chilies over the end. It's going to become very vibrant and very alive and a very awake pasta, and absolutely a great example of the two distinguished kind of guests here. We're talking about fresh pasta on the first course, the tacconi, and this spaghetti works out absolutely brilliantly. Mario, is this the region of Italy that uses the most hot chili powder? I, I know, powder, I know they do in, uh, in Rome, but it seems like... I believe that what in. they consider the spiciest is actually Calabria and Basilicata, okay, okay. but they use but a lot here, good. right, everything is always tuned up just a little bit. Now the next dessert is a classic Christmas, and this might have been served at Christmas had it not had the squash blossoms. They would have done this with zucchini, but squash blossoms are very specific to kind of the end of the harvest season, September, October, November. This is a very simple dough, just like a very short a shortbread where we take flour, and instead of using the actual butter, we've used olive oil, which creates an even softer dough and a little bit sweeter. And the way that we're going to make these beautiful cavincetti or cavinciuti or cuscinetti, there's a thousand ways to call this same dessert. What it is very renowned for is the Christmas season and it's these beautiful little Christmas fritters. We're going to take the dough and we're going to roll it out. And one of the things most traditional to Christmas in all of Abruzzo are these famous Zampognati, which are the traditional mountain kind of herdsmen that march down and go into Rome and sing this beautiful novena all around. How's the pasta there, Joe? Are you happy with that? And, they, and one, of the, one of the cool things about all of the different regions of Italy is that they always celebrate their traditional pastoral roads or, or um, roots. And that everything that they do, although they don't dress like that and they don't look like that and they don't behave like that anymore, every year there's always at least two or three examples where they can get together and the Alpini in the mountains up, by the, up in Friuli and also in Emilia put on their traditional garb and they march around and they do the songs or, or the, the chants or the prayers or the dance. I used to be a trombone player in an Alpini band. There you go. You know, I, I can see you with your little Robin. They wear these little Robin Hood hats with a little feather up in the air. And it's actually really, at first it looks kind of hokey and then you realize it's actually really a very cool way of preserving very much like the Midwest Square Dance. A lot of these things that we're kind of holding on to, although they're not a part of our daily tradition in America, it's really kind of the cool thing in Italy. So if you're in Rome and all of a sudden you see these guys with really funny kind of sandals and slippers and uh, bagpipes, you'll know that they're the Zampognari Abruzzesi. Now this, we're just going to roll this dough out, and then we're going to basically fry it. And you could fry it in the same exact oil as you did your zucchini blossoms, because the zucchini blossoms don't have such a big savory flavor that you're going to worry about having wrecked your oil. The filling on this is very simple and very much tradition to the Abruzzese area. They love their apricots and their apricot jam and their dessert, and often enough they make apricot stuff all through the winter because they preserve half of their apricots. The combination of apricots, almonds, and chocolate is also very Abruzzese. And what we're going to do is going to take some bittersweet chocolate and some toasted almonds and just stir the whole thing together. And what that creates is this kind of beautiful, interesting, fruity chocolate pie stuff to which we're going to thin with a little bit of 
Vin Santo. Now this one's from Tuscany, but you just might as you may as well easily use an Abruzzese sweet wine, which are not that easy to find, which is why we're using the one from Tuscany. I think it's interesting to note, like if you go from a saffron flavor in a pasta to a great dessert, when you're cooking the South, you can really take these really extracted red wines like Montepulciano and have them transcend from a savory pasta dish to a, and they to work a sweet well in dessert. Yeah, Absolutely. You, know, you can just finish off your dinner with another bottle of Montepulciano because dessert wines, quite frankly, are not that prolific in these southern zones. Right. Although a lot of their wines, due to the incredible heat, have that kind of a sweetness to them. There's almost a, there's almost a raisiny quality to a lot of the wines because what the sun brings is this incredible ripeness to wine. And it's almost a raisiny wine, particularly the Primitivo is a good right, example right. of that. Or this Multipulciano has actually got a good ripeness to it that will well, actually well. You know, the all-star of the sweet wines is the Marsala from Sicily, which right. is the real fortified sweet wines of southern Italy. Right, and they're absolutely delicious. Now, this is very simple to make, and again, just like a ravioli, just like a pasta, it's really all about understanding the balance. You don't want to overstuff this, because the real star of the game is the actual pasta or the dough itself. So what we're going to do is make sure we don't put too much of anything in here. And just like raviolis, we're going to dress them very simply. We're going to take a little bit of egg to add a little golden hue to the fry. And then we're just going to toss them in the fryer. Now, the fryer, as I said before, is exactly that same oil that we used for our zucchini flowers just minutes ago. And that's not going to affect us or bother us at all. The trick to frying is making sure you don't overcrowd your pan and also being ready to take something out if it looks done. So we're going to take it right to the fryer, which we've got at about 360 degrees, and drop them in and cook them. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about desserts in the South, as well as tasting these beautiful little cavinciutti. So please, stay with us. Hey, welcome back. Now, these are just perfectly fried, and there's nothing more intriguing and more beautiful than eating fried food right out of the fryer. And that makes it absolutely perfect. As opposed to seasoning it, we're going to spank it with a little bit of sugar. And then we're just going to bring it to the plate. And what we're going to finish it with are little bits of chopped hazelnuts. And these are hot, guys, so be careful. And a little drizzle of honey. And there you have a perfect, simple Abruzzese meal, drizzling with honey like so. I want to thank you guys for being here. You've made it a heck of a lot of fun. I want to thank you guys for being here. I only wish you could taste this stuff sometimes when I make it. I look forward to seeing you on the next Molto Mario. Ciao.